without further ado, uh, allow me to introduce uh, Chris Anichik. Chris is uh, the CTO, I believe, um, of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, but I'll let Chris correct me if I'm, if I'm yeah. wrong. Um, and is also heavily involved in the To Do Group, um, which is the Linux Foundation's uh, uh, in information sharing group for those involved in running open source programs um, at Linux Foundation members. Uh, so Chris is going to talk to us today about uh, best practices for running an open source program and project. Uh, Chris, you want to go ahead and, and complete that introduction and take it away? Cool. Uh, good, to, good to hear from everyone today. So a um, little brief introduction about myself before I kind of dive in on the topic around uh, you know, best practices and lessons learned from both the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation community, Kubernetes project, and uh, To Do Group. Um, a little background on myself. So, uh, I helped uh, start both the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and the Open Container Initiative, which were kind of efforts around bringing standards to uh, containers and also a kind of neutral home for container and cloud native related projects. Uh, I'm also the vice president of developer relations at the Linux Foundation, responsible for the to do group and, and bringing on new kind of foundations uh, to the organization in a previous life. Uh, you know, I used to run open source um, at Twitter, created their open source office, uh, was an open source maintainer working on things such as Gentoo Linux, Fedora. You know, spent some time in the in the Red Hat and IBM coal mines uh, back in the back in the day, working on a variety of projects. So, have a fun little uh, background from you know open source maintainer to person running uh, foundations. The last five years have been a little bit crazy for me, so I apologize if I'm a little extra haggard today, especially with the pandemic. But you know, the Kubernetes and cloud native ecosystems has grown. Uh, significantly uh, in the last five years. So it's been kind of a, a wild uh, ride to watch a technology uh, grow so fast and have so much impact uh, in industry. But on the bright side, when things tend to grow incredibly fast, uh, there's a lot of useful lessons that you kind of glean uh, from that effort and a lot of mistakes that you kind of share with folks so they could kind of learn, uh, learn from you. So, um, you know, I don't know how familiar, uh, you know, people here are on the call with kind of uh, open source, open source program in the general. So I'm going to spend a little time kind of giving a brief, uh, you know, you know, update of, uh, of my view of what's going on in the industry before diving in on some, you know, practical tips and lessons people could learn from. And then I'd like to really open up for questions to kind of keep things interactive uh, towards uh, the end. So uh, I'm sure uh, a, a lot of you um, are familiar with this, that uh, open source is no longer a hobbyist thing. Uh, it's in widespread use all over the enterprise. Uh, it's very easy for people generally to consume open source uh, these days. This is some data from uh, our TD group survey that we put up uh, every year around open source programs that essentially service uh, uh, surveys uh, corporations and, and corporate open source programs uh, out there based on, you know, what they're kind of doing with open source. Are you using it for commercial, non-commercial reasons? Are you contributing code upstream? Are you speaking at open source events? And, you know, the data basically shows the majority of people are, are consuming. This is no surprise for everyone. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do about people uh, contributing upstream. I think one little interesting tidbit that I'd like to share with folks is uh, it seems the financial services industry uh, is pretty good about, uh, you know, using, um, you know, uh, essentially, uh, you know, open source out there. But when it comes to actually contributing and sharing code upstream, they tend to not be as strong as, uh, you know, their other peer uh, industry verticals. But there's a lot of interesting data for you to kind of glean uh, from that survey linked off uh, the GitHub uh, on this slide. But hopefully with efforts like, uh, you know, Finn Austin, the work Linux Foundation does, we kind of change, um, you know, this so people are not only just consumers, but are contributing, uh, you know, upstream the projects and open sourcing things that they find useful to, to share with the world. Um, you know, another trend that's happening that uh, a lot of people, um, you know, should be familiar with is, you know, the historical kind of web scale, internet scale companies out there, given that their business models are really not about selling software, they're usually selling services, have been kind of on an open source bonanza. They've been sharing, um, you know, a lot of work that they've been doing to scale their own services, um, you know, from 
you know, uh, Google with Kubernetes and TensorFlow, you know, uh, Twitter, at my time at Twitter, we basically open sourced a majority of our uh, infrastructure not related to our ad server. Uh, you know, folks like LinkedIn open sourced Kafka, Netflix has its famous Netflix OSS stack, uh, Lyft, uh, you know, open source Envoy because they were, uh, you know, struggling dealing with a, a commercial slash open source alternative called Nginx. So there's this kind of notion that you know it's it's okay to share we we open source kind of what we're innovating uh, and, and potentially have our, our peers use it it's kind of becoming very commonplace uh in in the internet scale companies which is great because you know they're uh essentially you know facing a lot of scaling ch challenges and sharing what they learn where other industries and companies kind of take advantage uh, of, of 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 what they built the other kind of big you know, change uh, that I've noticed in in kind of open source land in general. We we've generally moved from let's let's say like single vendor closed ecosystems. You know, uh, from the past of you know you only buying you know a, a piece of software from one vendor or closed uh, you know a set of software to more kind of healthy uh, distributed multi vendor cross vendor eco uh, open ecosystems. You know things like. You know, CNCF, things like the RISC-5 um, organization, things like FinOS, these are all kind of healthy multiple vendor open ecosystems. And this is basically happening to almost every uh, industry vertical um, out there and will continue um, uh, to happen. And just like I mentioned, you know, I, this is open source thing is not slowing down anytime soon. It's going to continue to, um, you know, work its way into new industries as people find a way to uh, externalize some of their R&D costs and also uh, collaborate with their peers on essential, you know, commodity, uh, commodity things. So uh, open source programs. So with all this, you know, rise of open source goodness, uh, what are open source programs? So um, it's been this trend, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of these internet scale companies, you know, have been, uh, very successful in adopting and, and you know contributing and building open source projects and communities. And so one thing they did as part of this and lessons they learned is they essentially needed to create a center of competency or a group of folks that essentially owned the problem of what do you do uh, with all this open source that you both consume and produce, just like an organization would have a uh, you know, uh, a chief security officer or security uh, office to kind of deal with security issues. These companies have kind of pioneered the, the case of establishing an open source program. So, you know, you could look at some of the programs from Google and Facebook, but, you know, this is, you know, started maybe with these kind of internet scale companies, uh, but now has really uh, been, you know, pioneered all over throughout industries. You have kind of little old school traditional companies like your Autodesk, Comcast uh, of the world, uh, you know, uh, to big chip companies like uh, Intel, um, you know, Samsung, Salesforce, uh, you know, startups. These companies aren't really startups these days anymore since they're well-established public companies. But back when they were in their early kind of young uh, days, they uh, knew that it was important to create um, an open source uh, uh, program. Uh, Microsoft, as you're well aware, uh, has a very extensive open source program. Uh, they're heavily invested uh, in open source these days, even by picking up GitHub. Good for them. Uh, some companies are even establishing, you know, chief open source officers. Uh, Dirk Handel um, out in VMware uh, kind of leads their open source thing. So these are kind of serious executive uh, positions for open source things. So to degree, where does the two group come from? So when uh, you know I was building out the open source program at uh, Twitter, there was kind of a small group of us in the Bay Area that were essentially you know, commiserating, uh, you know, privately dealing with issues of like, you know, how do you deal with this issue? You know, hey, this person potentially, uh, you know, inserted a GPL code in a mobile app. We caught it a little bit late. You know, how do you do, you know, automated uh, checking and so on back in your company? So we essentially, you know, started this uh, group as kind of a private mailing list amongst, you know, companies like Google, <coughs> Google, you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and a couple others to kind of just share um, you know, practices, you know, uh, how did you build your developer dashboard? How do you prove your ROI for your company uh, and so on? And so, you know, this informal thing eventually became a formal thing, uh, which we called the Tudor group and announced it at the Facebook uh, scale conference in 2014. And eventually uh, we uh, decided that the organization uh, needed to become a little bit more formalized and uh, moved it to uh, the Linux Foundation to establish a more formal entity and governance structure um, uh, for the to-do group. So, you know, what exactly is a to-do group outside of just a group of companies that are collaborating on, you know, running open source programs? 
Um, well, you know, essentially that it's a core of it, you know, we're an affiliate kind of network for companies that either have an open source program or are about to establish an open source program. Uh, we share software training materials and other kind of useful uh, things that, you know, people could benefit from who are kind of in this position, because um, even though open source programs tend to be a little bit different across uh, companies, there's a lot of similar tools and lessons uh, learned that could be shared amongst amongst each other. So uh, one important thing to know uh, about this is, you know, there is a kind of a difference between what you would have uh, considered like hobbyist open source or just an open source project versus truly corporate scale uh, open source. You know, one thing we noticed when we were kind of building out our programs is uh, the tools that you need to manage, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of repositories or, you know, uh, thousands of engineers working on, you know, upstream uh, projects or stuff like that it is very complicated. Uh, a lot of tools out there, whether like GitHub or GitLab these days, just weren't really built uh, in mind to deal with corporate scale open source. So we generally uh, went out ahead and, you know, grafted and built tools on top of GitHub, Git, et cetera, to kind of deal with corporate scale uh, open source uh, problems. The tools are getting a little bit better these days, um, but, um, you know, that was kind of the original uh, impetus um, of, of, of the group to kind of get around this problem, you know. Uh, historically, you know, GitHub's team management and role management was absolutely atrocious back in the day. and we worked uh, successfully with GitHub to improve that system uh, over time. So things are a little bit, uh, you know, better now than they than they were before. Um, another thing that we kind of served uh, for a time, you know, when GitHub was very small, we kind of served as their product council to improve a variety of, of features. So a lot of things that you've kind of seen in GitHub uh, may have uh, ended up, uh, you know, coming from uh, the Tudu group uh, pushing GitHub. And we actually have a repo uh, out there that uh, GitHub checks quite frequently and works with basically is just all the problems that you have uh, dealing uh, with GitHub. So uh, check that out if you're interested in uh, looking at some of the kind of ideas and suggestions we've had to improve the platform um, over the years. And, you know, in terms of membership, we're about, you know, 50 or so organizations spanning, you know, a, a variety of companies out there. And we're always uh, looking to kind of learn uh, and bring on uh, new folks from, from new industries. It would be great in my opinion, to have some uh, more financial related companies involved in the group. We have a, we have a couple with, you know, Fidelity and, uh, and so on, but I'd love to really see uh, more organizations from the finance side. So uh, another thing the TD group does, uh, as I mentioned, is, you know, given that open source programs are still a bit of a nascent, you know, practice in the industry, a few years uh, ago, we decided to create a survey uh, that we uh, essentially you know, uh, partner with a uh, publication called the New Stack and essentially go out and send this out to all companies out there to kind of get an idea of whether they have an open source program, whether they're looking to plan uh, to build an open source program, how are they using open source, what are their kind of problems and so on. So we share this data uh, every year. Uh, we're actually, we just launched the 22 edition of the survey. So if your organization is using open source or is building an open source program, we'd love to hear from you. I have a link. Uh, there for you to see, but uh, in general, um, you know, this is kind of useful information, especially if you're looking to figure out, you know, what is the size of an open source, you know, program, you know, compared to, um, you know, other organizations. And one interesting thing from, you know, uh, at least the survey, you kind of see the, you know, which type of industry verticals have open source programs, obviously both kind of uh, tech and telco, uh, oddly, uh, have, a, have a bit of bias compared to, to, to others, at least uh, compared to you know, financial services, which comes uh, down a little bit the middle uh, middle rank uh, compared to compared to everyone else. Let's talk a little bit about you know starting an open source program before diving into some kind of uh, tips and, and practices learned from CNCF and so on. So, uh, the Tudor Group maintains a open source program definition, uh, you know, which we kind of cultivated um, over the years, and we have a guide that you kind of learn from. So. Uh, we're looking to the group that got some crazy background noise. <laughs> cool. Thank you for whoever uh, muted the, the hair dryer. Um, so, <laughs> so you can look at our open source definition if you're kind of looking to uh, understand uh, what an actual open source um, uh, program is. 
you know, uh, if, if you if you have one within your company, you, you should be kind of aware that open source program responsibilities kind of vary across organization, depending, you know, what type of, you know, product your company sells, you know, if you're mostly selling, you know, services, software is less, you know, potentially relevant uh, to you. But if you're selling software, um, you know, obviously you have to have a, a little bit more particular strategy around how you manage uh, your IP. But, you know, generally these are some responsibilities that uh, open source program share and a lot, all this information is up available on um, the tutor group GitHub and, and, and website. Um, one thing we also do is share software and ideas. So we have something called an awesome list for open source program management. Uh, a lot of challenges that our open source programs faced were around, you know, how do you manage potentially CLAs at scale? How do you deal with metrics across different projects and organizations? How do you deal with developer affiliations? What tools do you use for licensing, internationalization, and so on? So uh, we have all these available online for you to kind of poke at, uh, play with, and learn from, and even contribute your own. Uh, contribute, uh, your own. Um, the other thing you know that I'll stress is you know a lot of these programs are basically able to scale based on just developing tooling to kind of deal with all sorts of problems, whether it's you know uh, linting repositories. We have a tool called Repo Linter, which basically just lints. Uh, a, a GitHub repository for quality. So whether you know you have a security.md file or you have a license file, et cetera, you know, licenses in every file. So just kind of useful tools like this that we kind of share. And if you kind of look at uh, that link I, I shared earlier, um, a lot of companies kind of have shared uh, their tools in terms of how they manage uh, open source um, uh, at scale. Um, another thing that, uh, you know, uh, companies have kind of been doing mostly internally is building a, uh, you know, open source kind of tech radar for your organization. So I don't know if people are familiar with an organization out there called ThoughtWorks, but they kind of put together this ThoughtWorks tech radar, you know, showing which technologies that you should, you know, adopt or assess or drop, uh, et cetera. Well, there's a, a project out there called uh, Zalando Open Source, which allows you to build your own tech radar. And uh, a lot of open source programs uh, that I've worked with essentially have been kind of serving as uh, almost an, like an architecture review board or uh, you know, source of truth when it comes to which open source projects folks should kind of look at. And, and this is kind of one mechanism that some of them are starting to use uh, in, internally to kind of share uh, practices. So I generally recommend uh, checking that out, super useful, better than essentially a, 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 a spreadsheet of, of some type. Uh, and, and finally, um, you know, there's a lot of guides that we've uh, open sourced from, you know, learning how to archive your open source project. You have to, how do you measure your open source program? And they're all kind of available online in, you know, English, Japanese, Chinese, and, and a variety of languages. So please, uh, you know, check them out uh, in detail. So. Now we'll talk a little bit more about starting uh, and cultivating an open source project, uh, project, you know, why you should do it, what lessons have we learned in, you know, CNCF and Tutor Group that we kind of share with the wider uh, audience. So, um, you know, when it comes to uh, starting an open source project, uh, you know, there's many reasons to do it, depending if, if you're, uh, you know, a company, you know, maybe you want to undercut your competition somehow, maybe you want to share and externalize some R&D so you're not doing uh, all the work on a particular project. Maybe you want to commoditize a market, you know, similar to what IBM did with Eclipse tooling, where they basically decided to come out, commoditize most of the developer tooling, um, you know, market out there. So companies like, you know, Borland don't really uh, exist uh, anymore. Maybe you want to build an ecosystem, kind of like the Kubernetes play. Uh, maybe you want to engage and partner with your customers uh, uh, and so on and kind of support some kind of common or commodity piece of software. So there's lots of good reasons to uh, you know, start an open source, uh, you know, project could be hiring, you know, common thing for a lot of uh, companies in, uh, uh, in, in the internet scale uh, area. Um, so some good questions to, oops, one sec, I got a little uh, track. So questions before you should ask, uh, questions you ask yourself before you start uh, an open source project is, you know, number one, are you duplicating any work that may exist out there? You know, there's a uh, hundred, million plus repositories out there and projects that exist. So I think it's important to kind of get your bearings on where engineers have a tendency to uh, reinvent the wheel or start from scratch versus joining an existing effort. I think uh, an important role in open source program office is to evaluate and ensure that that duplication uh, is, is not happening. Uh, understanding what constitutes success for an open source project, that's gonna be different for you know, uh, you know, everyone. 
Uh, you know, can you actually financially support and sustain the project? There's many times uh, we've interacted with companies that, you know, open source something, shared it on, you know, GitHub or, you know, uh, whatever place, but they didn't really invest in, you know, uh, building a community or even, you know, throwing engineering resources on it. You know, they're like, oh, we just open sourced it to share some lessons and we put someone part time on it. You know, that's not really uh, going to help, uh, you know, long term. It truly takes uh, a, a bit of open source gardening and cultivating to kind of really grow a project. It really, you know, community doesn't really come uh, for free. So uh, a lot of these lessons are shared in, in the guide that I, I linked below in terms of uh, starting uh, it, uh, an open source project. So uh, to kind of, you know, head towards our kind of final chapter here for our, our talk today before I open it up for questions is some best practices and kind of, you know, basic lessons we learned uh, over the years, uh, you know, within the Tudor group and, and my recent experience at CNCF. This shouldn't be a surprise for anyone. Using standardized licenses is great. You know, OSI, FSF approved license. We generally uh, recommend uh, permissive licenses, uh, particularly Apache 2 due to its patent friendliness. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we kind of detail uh, in a CNCF blog post why we explicitly recommend Apache. I highly recommend you take a read of that, but this should be kind of standard operating procedure for uh, anyone if your goal is true wide adoption, we find permissive licenses uh, generally work uh, the best uh, for that and preferably ones that have some language uh, in it to kind of deal with, you know, uh, patents and so on could could definitely um, help. Um, you know, one thing that we do within CNCF that's been uh, super useful is have all of our projects uh, have a best practices badge from the core infrastructure initiative, which is another Linux foundation project. You could basically think of this as, uh, I don't know if you read the book checklist manifesto, but essentially it is a checklist of things and practices that an open source project should have, uh, as a best practice. Um, these are things like you should have a potential security disclosure me uh, mechanism. You should have static analysis. You should have a way for projects to contact you to report issues, you know, kind of just basic, you know, uh, things that are just super useful for people to kind of go through and, and ensure that their project has, because evidently developers forget things, but this essentially is a good way to kind of codify, you know, best practices we've seen um, over the years. And we have, you know, uh, thousands, a few thousand projects now that have uh, adopted this uh, across the open source um, ecosystem. So highly recommend everyone kind of uh, takes, takes a look at that. Um, you know, uh, developer statistics, you know, there's many uh, tools out there, but a lot of the stuff that comes built in with GitHub or GitLab is generally not sufficient. So we generally recommend people uh, either take a look at kind of what we uh, done with a project called DevStats. There's companies out there like Tergia that uh, build stuff too. But in general, I, I think it's important to have a singular dashboard you could point people to within your community to understand the healthier projects, uh, uh, you know, who's contributing and, and so on. And so one thing that, let me see if I can share this really quick. Uh, you know, we have a simple dashboard here for the CNCF community, which just shows, you know, here's all our projects. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, I have to apologize, but here's all the projects. You could see, you know, uh, days since last commit, all of these are fairly active. You could see number of commits, you know, are they increasing versus the last, you know, <clears throat> three months versus the current three months, and you kind of have just a quick, you know, overview of health. Uh, you could look for a medium, you know, median time to respond to issues across these things. So stuff like this within your open source project or community is is super value, even internally as a as a company. Uh, having something like this is, is is super important to kind of really understand, uh, you know, the health uh, of things. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, we generally recommend um, is having an open governance structure, and, that, and that's truly uh, just, you know, defining how you perform project actions within your community. So these are things like, you know, how, uh, you know, do we have elections? How, how is a project governed? Who owns the trademarks, domains? How is all that managed, build systems, and so on? So having open, transparent governance generally builds trust uh, in, in your community and I think really helps with uh, growth and adoption uh, of, of projects. Uh, we have a lot of examples um, for you to kind of learn from. Um, there's really no kind of one way uh, to do this, but if you go to opengovernance.dev, you could go look at uh, you know, some basic checklists, checklists and examples for you to kind of learn from to, to add to your projects. Uh, I, I truly wish uh, GitHub and GitLab uh, one day kind of uh, 
adopt some kind of standard around this where you kind of have a, a definition just like you have a you know a license file you know governance file becomes kind of standard standard operating practice for for github um, other kind of things that we've learned that you know generally has been hard for a lot of companies that are new to open source um, defaulting to open communications for basically everything so having public meeting minutes uh, recording meetings having them posted on you know youtube or whatever forum open agendas where anyone would kind of show up and contribute to the agendas uh, rotating kind of meeting coordinators so people don't get burned out uh, and so on i highly recommend uh, looking at the kubernetes community uh, for their kind of guidelines of, of what they <clears throat> have uh, done to kind of uh, deal with this problem especially for community i scaled um, uh, you know over, over time they have a lot of good practices uh, in there um, code of conducts you know these things have become uh, you know standard practice now for the most part which is great uh, our advice here is don't reinvent the wheel here. There's some great code of conducts out there uh, from organizations like the Contributor Covenant. Um, another kind of thing to uh, share is, um, for the most part, you generally don't, you know, have issues over time. But you know, when you know your your n in terms of time grows longer, you're always going to have your you know asshole or bad actor in the community. And and when you have that, being able to deal with that situation is challenging right and i highly recommend potentially uh having your community or company organization look at code of conduct in incident you know training and response uh, there's a couple of companies out there that do that i just linked one of them but it's super useful to kind of test drive um your process uh, the other important thing uh to, to share here is uh essentially having your community and project police itself versus uh you know an independent mediator is probably best practice. It essentially, you know, have your community be responsible in terms of deciding uh, what is uh, proper conduct and, and so on is, is kind of a, a better practice uh, for us. Uh, you know, this one, you know, should be obvious these days, but, uh, you know, some new projects that I work at the Linux Foundation is a little bit surprising that some people don't have a public driven community CI CD uh, system. Generally, uh, you know, when we started, the Kubernetes and CNCF in the beginning, you know, Kubernetes CI uh, and CD uh, actually uh, was still kind of somewhat owned by Google at the time. So generally for complex setup, it takes time to kind of make this whole process community driven. But these days it's significantly easier with things like GitHub Actions, Circle CI. There's just a ton of, you know, great CI CD tools out there, but essentially giving people uh, access that they could, you know, A, contribute to this, maintain this, uh, and, and so on is 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 crucially as important just as you know maintaining uh, you know the the source code. Um, acknowledging contributors, you know, this sounds a little bit silly, but you know one thing we've done for a long time is for you know people that uh, contribute something to Kubernetes, we would basically uh, send them uh, a, a contributor patch, you know, uh, for them to kind of put on their laptop or on a piece of clothing. But generally uh, rewarding. And acknowledging contributors, first-time contributors in our community is, is something that we've seen just pays dividends uh, over the long term. And you know, it could be as simple as acknowledgement on a, a website, but you know, do something in a way where people kind of feel special uh, contributing uh, in your, uh, in, 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 you know, to your community. Um, you know, other kind of cool uh, things we've done in the past. Um, you know, uh, our build landscapes. So in CNCF, we built this. Tool, uh, essentially that displays the overall landscape of projects and adopters uh, in our community. We've done this for uh, a variety of projects, mostly in the Linux Foundation, but it's a super useful way for you to go. You know, the CNCF one is definitely uh, a little excessive uh, here because we have a, a larger complex uh, you know, community with projects from all different sides, but it's generally super easy for us to kind of highlight and filter our projects and members in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, you could filter by, you know, hey, you know, which projects and companies come from China? It's very simple to filter. You can go see, you know, the market cap of said company. So it's a very detailed thing and super kind of useful uh, thing um, that we recommend for folks. It doesn't have to be complex. We have some other communities like GraphQL that have much simpler, um, you know, landscapes, but um, it's something that we find uh, super useful and something we generally recommend now for uh, projects that kind of have a, a good ecosystem component uh, to it. Uh, another thing that should be straight uh, uh, obvious for folks is, you know, like as I mentioned before, communities don't come for free. So having things like conferences, 
meetups and so on are, are super useful. Um, I have a little graph here that kind of shows when we started our Kubernetes conferences and cloud native conferences back in uh, 2015. You know, we had about 500 or so people show up. Um, you know, last year we had over 20,000 people. So, you know, these things tend to grow over time, but in general, you know, it's not that hard for, uh, you know, someone to host a, a meetup, um, you know, uh, out there, but it's, you know, just a reminder that it's important to not only invest in the building of said software, but also the uh, kind of community growth and community management of, of, of a piece of code. Uh, internationalization, you know, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of sec success with uh, international localization. Um, you know, we essentially saw a, a fundamental, uh, you know, increase in contributions to Kubernetes when we enable the site for translations. Um, you know, and there's a lot of different tools out there to do this, depending on what you use. There's, you know, Mozilla has built stuff, there's Zenata, there's, uh, uh, you know, third party companies you kind of work with. But it's just a fundamental easy thing that you could do that uh, generally when you start your project, it's easier to have internalization, localization kind of baked in versus trying to go uh, you know, uh, do that, um, you know, after you have, you know, some major releases, it definitely took us a lot of work to, uh, perform that in Kubernetes because initially when we, uh, you know, built out the Kubernetes site, it was not built for internationalization and it was a bit of a nightmare to, um, uh, to, to do that, but eventually it definitely paid uh, dividends once, once we did it, uh, internships, you know, one, one common complaint, you know, we have from projects are that. You know, we would love more maintainers. We'd love people outside our company to come uh, contribute. Um, you know, we found uh, a huge amount of success in having our own internships programs or participating with efforts like Google Summer of Code, which is about to kick off. Uh, even the Linux Foundation has a free internship mentoring platform community uh, grid, which allows you to kind of match make projects, mentors and mentees and be able to pay them. Uh, basically any time. So this is just uh, one of the most useful things I think you could uh, do uh, for, for your project. And one interesting thing is after doing this for a few years in CNCF in particular, we've had folks that have, you know, basically started out as a intern, you know, that worked on a project that eventually they became a maintainer on that project, which eventually led to full-time jobs related to that project, where they, they worked on that project full time, where they, you know, had their first job in industry. And to me, that's just like incredibly uh, rewarding and, and super useful when it comes to, um, you know, uh, your community, because these people will take that experience and potentially that project to new companies that they join and potentially get them to adopt it, which generally just helps the overall ecosystem uh, for you. Um, another kind of cool thing um, that I recommend that uh, is possible now that hasn't really been possible in the past is automating things like license scanning. Um, you know, this used to be a more uh, laborious effort back in the day, but with tools like SNCC, FASA, Fasology, you could basically make license scanning a part of your build process. Highly recommend you check out tools like this. It's just, it just makes life a lot uh, easier than kind of manually uh, doing this to so kind of catch your developers uh, in the early days if they make any mistakes. Um, you know, another kind of legal thing to discuss is, uh, we're huge fans of the developer certificate of origin over things like CLAs. Um, you know, there are, you know, justifications to have a CLA, but, um, a DCO could definitely lower the barrier of entry when it comes to people that contribute to a project where a CLA generally has to, you know, <clears throat> go to a legal department or, you know, get someone with signing authority to sign that document and just deals with a lot of essentially, um, you know, churn that you have to go through to kind of get someone to contribute to the project. DCO provides a, you know, set of legal protections with a little bit lower barrier of entry. Projects like, you know, Linux, um, you know, use this and it's a fairly successful, uh, you know, uh, legal practice that many people aren't uh, aware of. And on the bright side, uh, GitHub and other, even GitLab has basically bots that check for uh, DCO these days. So it just makes it super easy for you to kind of implement um, in your project. Uh, other kind of cool things, uh, security disclosure process. Uh, anytime your project gets any uh, sign of success long-term, um, you'll basically have to create something like this. Uh, on the bright side, if you're using GitHub, they now have some you know nice built-in mechanisms to kind of help uh, define a security disclosure process, release process, and also promote uh, security advisories through a, a, an API and programmatic uh, way for folks. Um, there's a lot of 
uh, examples out there. If you just search security.md across GitHub, you could see some examples uh, out there, but this is something that I uh, recommend folks do earlier than later, especially if you have, uh, if you really, really truly want to invest in building a long-term uh, projects. There are third-party tools out there like HackerOne that could help, uh, you know, kind of uh, you define this if, if you're looking for more of kind of a paid uh, offering. Uh, as I mentioned before, just like license scanning, a lot of security tooling these days is quote unquote shifting left, where, you know, you're able to both scan for security issues at, you know, development time and build time, uh, you know, now. So there's a lot of tools out there from, you know, vendors I mentioned before. Um, there's also fuzzers out there, which are becoming uh, a more common uh, thing, but anything you kind of do to kind of include these uh, types of tools within your project uh, shows benefits. We found tons of uh, issues within CNCF projects like Kubernetes, Envoy, and so on by uh, fuzzing, uh, you know, fuzzing them. So highly recommended. Uh, another kind of interesting practice that, you know, I think is kind of new to open source land is uh, security audits. You know, generally these are things that, you know, companies have historically done for products and, and things they've done. But one practice that we've been doing within CNCF is uh, performing, you know, and uh, hiring third party firms to do security audits on our open source projects and also open source and share all the results, you know, from, you know, the tools they use to any threat models they built. Um, there's a great set of vendors that are starting to do this and are a little bit more familiar with uh, open source projects. Um, highly recommend you check them out. Um, there's an effort we have under the Linux Foundation called OSTIF. Uh, Mozilla has a uh, Mozilla security effort that's been doing a lot of audits on open source stuff. So it's, it's a good kind of list of uh, examples you kind of learn from. It's, it's something uh, that is not the cheapest thing in the world, but it is a very high value activity because A, it improves uh, you know, the quality of the project generally, because, you know, a lot of times, you know, we've had issues where we've had a project that may have defined a security disclosure project in CNCF, but they've never actually had a security bug reported. And this was kind of one way to kind of guarantee that happened. So it's kind of a, a good way to kind of battle test your, your process too. So huge, hugely recommended practice. Uh, and then kind of finally, before I uh, take questions uh, for the last like 20 minutes or so is, I think it's important to, to note that, you know, all open source projects, you know, have a life cycle, just like any product, you know, not every project is going to be successful. Um, you know, some may, you know, never grow to a size of like a Kubernetes and Linux, but it's important to understand that you should kind of allocate your resources a little bit differently as projects are in a different thing. When you're launching a project, you obviously want to invest in community management, building a little bit of marketing versus, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, the growth, uh, the, the further kind of commercializations and maintaining and archiving stages of the project. So just something to, to kind of remind people and think about. A lot of times people tend to treat open source projects different from products, but in general, I find them very, you know, similar in, in terms of life cycles and, and so on. So it's just something to kind of uh, keep in mind. And, you know, not every open source project turns, um, you know, out. Uh, to, to be a huge success. So potentially it's something you should look at archiving uh, and so on. And we have a great to-do group ride on kind of how to archive and sunset uh, projects if you kind of get to that uh, situation. So um, that's basically uh, it. You know, I'd love to kind of take any questions, um, you know, from folks, but to kind of like summarize things is, you know, there's really kind of no one size fits all approach when it comes to open source projects or open source programs. They're really kind of custom built for the company or community. Um, you know, and, you know, the, the lesson I've kind of always shared for companies I've uh, consulted with or worked with is, you know, uh, truly uh, contribution is the currency in open source. And if you don't have contribution to projects, you can't influence them. So if you're depending on all this software, find a way to kind of insert yourself so you kind of influence these things to a direction uh, that benefits you. And if you're interested uh, in learning more from kind of companies that are going through this, I highly recommend uh, you take a look at uh, joining the Tito group. We have a Slack and a bunch of guides and stuff on GitHub that you kind of contribute to. So um, that kind of wraps things up. If, uh, you know, I'd love to kind of take any questions, um, you know, from folks to kind of make the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, interactive. But if not, you could find me uh, online, uh, CRA on Twitter and uh, Cianizic or CRA at linuxfoundation.org if you want to catch up uh, over email. So uh, I hope you learned um, something new today. And thank you for the uh, FinOS folks, Gab and Aaron, for inviting me to, to share some thoughts uh, today. So 
happy to take questions depending how you want to do this. Let me go find my. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Um, it was a, that was a, a lot of, a lot of material in, in 40 minutes. So, um, I'm <laughs> sure that we have folks, um, on the call with questions. Um, remember, please to unmute yourselves, uh, if you have any questions for Chris. If not, I have some. Before you do, I was going to say that I've just posted the slides um, from our LinkedIn page uh, at the bottom of the chat, if you find the chat like Chris did earlier, uh, plus all the links um, are in the chat. So um, I have one question from your experience with the to-do group and, and working with, uh, you know, working with companies on their sort of journey toward toward an effective open source program office yep. um, because you know in in the financial services industry you sort of see collected on this call here um, the folks who are who are um, pushing hard in that direction um, in this industry and you know we see we see the sort of same pattern um, uh, repeating from firm to firm about just how you know where folks get started and how they progress from you know, maybe their first open source project to having a, a an open source program that can sort of process a number of um, open source uh, contribution requests at a time and and you know, just sort of manage things at scale. And I'm just wondering you know, whether you have any thoughts on sort of where you see common common mistakes or pitfalls or um, you know how folks can can sure that they're sort of um, headed in the right direction with putting together their open source programs. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, oops, sorry, I muted myself. As I mentioned before, you know, I, I think for the financial industry, you know, just like any other industry, you know, the, the lessons learned are, you know, A, having, you know, someone own the problem full time is generally uh, important uh, with full kind of buy-in from uh, you know uh, executive team that you know open source is something uh, important uh, you know outside of just you know purely uh, compliance, which is you know kind of how a lot of open source programs have historically chart, uh, started, and essentially defining uh, the metrics uh, for the success of that program. Whether you know a lot of a lot of times if you're you know, uh, you know, engineer building a product, you know, uh, you know, your team is going to be defining a set of KPIs, OKRs, you know, whatever you want to call them, you know, doing that exact same thing for your open source program and getting, you know, concrete uh, agreement amongst all the stakeholders in your company, I think is important to kind of show the value and, you know, deciding what those metrics are for uh, your organizations are important depending on what they do. So I don't know if in, in you know, financial firms, like, you know, maybe, Ensuring that you know, uh, you know, uh, we have no compliance, uh, you know, uh, incidents or you know, uh, any responses to the open source program, you know, are handled within a certain SLA. Uh, you know, uh, an engineer could consume uh, open source and get approval to do something within, you know, 24 hours or 40 hours. Essentially, defining those metrics, sharing them, having buy-in uh, from everyone, and just having that publicly available inside. Uh, the company, I think, is kind of something I've seen that helped has helped uh, the success uh, for a lot of people starting out. So, you know, short define the metrics and having that kind of you know dashboard available, just just like any other kind of engineering effort um, within a company. So, I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, Aaron, but that's kind of um, you know from what, what I've noticed is ensure that someone owns the problem. You define your core set of metrics, just like you have any other project in the company, and make those fully uh, accessible. To folks. Other questions? All right, I'm going to ask another one then. No uh, so, uh, again, sticking with the topic of, of uh, open source program offices, um, you know, I think the first step that a lot of uh, the companies on the line take yeah. is to get their get their compliance house in order. Um, you know, make sure that they they're tracking the open source they're using, and then um, maybe they'll do a a you know a pilot um, of open sourcing something of their own 
even before they get into contributing a lot to external projects. Yeah. But, you know, as companies are looking to, um, to begin making their first contributions to external open source projects, I think there's, a, there's this sort of idea that maybe that is um, in some ways, you know, increasing a, a, a higher risk activity than either, you know, consuming open source or open sourcing their own projects. And, and you know, often the first steps there are tentative. Um, do you have any any thoughts on how to sort of um, go from you know how to how to make your first uh, contributions to the world at large, and then how to how to scale that up so that you know you're sort of enabling your development organization to participate fully in open source? Sure, I think I think the first step would be basically cataloging and indexing all of you know kind of the open source you know, you're using, so you have an understanding of, you know, what you potentially may want to contribute to, uh, and also understanding, you know, it's interesting from my time looking, uh, you know, uh, at Twitter, which was, you know, a couple thousand, you know, engineers, uh, you know, size organization, uh, after doing that indexing effort, the amount of uh, duplicative forks and just, you know, uh, projects that, you know, you know, just different versions of, of all sorts of crazy stuff that was out there that the open source program basically helped, you know, uh, catalog and work with teams to understand, well, this team, you know, is using, you know, Redis for key value services, memcache, you know, maybe you should go standardize one and then contribute to just one of those upstream has kind of been a, a, a very kind of useful activity for an open source program. And, and the other thing is, uh, I, I think when these companies start contributing, there's there's more trusted places to contribute than others. So, you know, there's a lot of organizations out there in particular open source foundations, folks like, you know, the Apache Foundation, Eclipse, Linux Foundation, set of projects generally have very strong, you know, IP policies and maturity about them versus just some random, you know, library you have on GitHub. So basically coming up with essentially, uh, you know, uh, a whitelist or some type of levels uh, out there where, you know, hey, you know, these areas are safe, uh, you know, potentially to contribute uh, versus others I've seen as a, as a fairly kind of successful way to kind of ease uh, towards, uh, towards folks. And essentially it's interesting because sometimes that causes uh, engineering teams to make decisions on what open source software to adopt. Like they may choose something out of a, you know, uh, a well-trusted foundation versus just something they find um, on, on, on GitHub. So there's a couple things um, I've seen there. Uh, uh, can you talk more about the, the major differences between the DCO and the CLA? Yeah, I mean, so uh, it, it's, so DCO is, is very much extremely standardized, right? And that basically, uh, tells, let me go find, let me go to my slide. Basically, uh, DCO is basically guaranteeing that the contribution that you received uh, from someone is something they have the right to submit to. They basically wrote it themselves. They didn't copy it from, you know, yada, yada. This is all kind of came from <clears throat> experiences from the SCO lawsuit back in the day. CLAs are uh, a lot more variable because there is not one standard type of CLA. There, there's different ones, right? There's, you know, there's something like the Apache CLA, which exists that a lot of companies use, but there's also CLAs out there that do copyright assignment and other kind of legal nefarious things. CLAs generally are things that uh, require, you know, someone with, you know, legal authority in your company to sign. It's like a process, right? It essentially makes the barrier for contribution much higher. But, um, you know, versus like a DCO, which essentially just requires a developer to kind of sign off uh, within Git each commit, git commit dash S is, 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 is fairly simple. So, um, yeah, but yeah. The, the, CLA, the CLA doesn't give the same IP protection. The DCO doesn't give the same IP protection as CLA, right? It depends on the CLA. A lot of CLAs will have language in them, like I, cer I certify that I wrote this contribution myself. I didn't copy it from anywhere. So... Uh, you know, you can almost view CLAs as has, uh, being a subset of what is specified uh, in, in, in a DCO with, with more potential 
things around copyright assignment or other stuff. Like th there is no standard CLA, so it's kind of a hard, uh, hard thing. They tend to be kind of custom depending uh, on community that you're working with. You know, open source foundations, their CLA tend to be very kind of fair, more straightforward. Uh, companies that tend to have CLA are usually protecting themselves. Um, you know, if they have an open source product that they're building, maybe they require, you know, a, a license or even assignment to all uh, the copyright associated. So I find DCOs as fairly uh, a lightweight mechanism to kind of get you a lot of the, the typical legal guarantees that you would truly care about uh, in, in a project, especially paired with a patent friendly license, like an Apache 2.0 uh, type, type style license. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Um, I've got one question. I don't know. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I hear you well, Reza. Hi, um, this is um, I'm Reza Alabi. I'm working with um, open source, um, uh, Wipro open source global practice. Yep. I'm, I'm actually quite new to open source, um, and my background is security, risk, and governance. And we, uh, uh, I, I was asked to be engaged in one of the clients, Wipro's client in 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 the UK. Um, the subjects I, or the question I want to ask, uh, the subjects may not really be, um, lots of open source folks may not like the question itself, but I'm also part of a risk management committee, RM1 in a British standard institution, VSI, as part of ISO global practice. Uh, one of the first things I've noticed when I started my involvement with open source governance, I've realized there's no written standard or a framework. Uh, it's, uh, it's something which in other practice you refer to. Uh, so if, if you do if you do IT governance, you refer to ISO 38500. Uh, you, if you do data quality, you refer to ISO 8000, so on and so forth. You don't have to, but there are frameworks available for um, for uh, for various practices in security and risk, as you um, well know. Um, I am. I, I also took an initiative. I to in one of the RM1 committees about six seven months ago. I uh, presented an open source from a governance and risk uh, perspective for them, uh, the risk management uh, perspective, to um, to explain to them the deficiencies in in industry and and how reluctant uh, some of the uh, some of organizations are to get engaged with open source governance and management because there is no specific written standard or framework. There are lots of them available, as as, as I've learned. Uh, you, you you know you 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 guys know more than me, but I, I, I've I just uh, seen a lot. But um, I've, I've my current current project, I had to um, uh, borrow um, uh, stuff from um, various standards and frameworks. Um, I, I, I use COVID, for instance, for certain elements, and uh, ISO eight thousand. Do you think there is a, there is a, a, a appetite and, and also it's a need uh, at all to, uh, to create a working group as part of global ISO standard or BSI in, in UK uh, in, in order to, to bring um, experts and expertise from a various parts of open source but there is a compliance or risk or um, security and, and create a, a kind of uh, open source champions for standards, something like that, to give a, a coherent framework, uh, which everyone can refer to, like, oh, um, if you want to do cybersecurity, go to NIST uh, or cloud security, do this and that. Do you, do you think that's something achievable or do you think this is, um, considering uh, the open source uh, community globally, uh, the, mm, uh, the, 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 um, the politics or mechanism in, in that community. Do you think this is, this is something achievable? Uh, 
or doable? This, what, what do you think about this? I, I think, I mean, asking everyone basically, but um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's not, it's not a bad idea to have, you know, what you would traditionally have like ISO standards for a variety of things. And so people can leverage and, and use them. But I find in open source, they're, they're, they're almost, you know, there's almost a desire to kind of build things on your own. It's, it's kind of like, the, it was like an Ikea effect. If you kind of build it your own, you kind of feel better about it. And, Cultivate on your own. So, you know, for CNCF, we have a lot of projects that they craft their own governance. Like, there's no one way to kind of do it. So they do it on their own, and then when they do it, they kind of feel good about it because it's theirs. It's their little, you know, thing that they built, um, and so on. But there could be, there could be standards for things around, you know, what it means to be a good, uh, like secure project or you know, good open source project. Like, uh, I'm sharing my screen right now. We have something called like the best practices effort from. CII, which a lot of projects go to, and there's essentially, you know, uh, like a, a checklist of things, you know, what a, a good project should have from like working build system, automated test suite, all the, all this stuff. So like, I think there is opportunities to, you know, develop stuff like this, but generally open source developers prefer a more automated, you know, type uh, approach to, to things if you can. They, they tend to not, you know, they, they ignore, you know, standards as much as possible, at least from my experience, at least the communities I tend to work with, which tend to be a little bit. Uh, um, well, I, I said to one, 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 one of our, uh, one of our colleagues who's been in uh, open source um, ecosystem for the last 20, 25 years, 30 years, and, and he said, phew, he, he hated. The idea. He just hated the idea. Um, that's why I just. This is the first time I'm actually asking this question and and, and, the, and this from this audience, and and I'm more than happy to to have a further conversation if if you or Aaron or um, Rob you think that's um, that that's something you you guys can facilitate or you think it could be um, something out of this conversation come out. I think knowledge sharing is always always good. Understanding people's perspectives and, and problems and, and and what they've dealt with and sharing what what we've learned is I think it's super useful. So I'm always happy to have a conversation. Yeah, that's that that would be that would be great if we have that conversation in separately. Um, Thank you, Rizan. Yeah, I don't I don't have a, your access um, uh, email ad address, and yeah. we can we can set up something and. Have, have a conversation now. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at the end of the hour, so I want to give a hearty thank you to Chris Anna Sick, not Anna Schick. Apologies for mispronouncing it before. All right. Um, of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and the Linux Foundation, um, and thank to everyone who who showed up. Uh, it was a terrific presentation. I hope everyone got a lot out of it. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again at our next uh, meeting in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.